if you're on the dark web, you're probably there only for one reason, to stay anonymous. Here's the hard truth though. Most people think they're anonymous when they're really not, and they're making a lot of mistakes, leaving traces everywhere. In this video, I'm going to be showing you the crucial mistakes that people make that expose their identity, their data, and their private affairs to the wrong eyes. Whether you're trying to avoid surveillance or hackers, or just to protect your privacy in general, there are certain missteps that you cannot afford to make. If your goal is true anonymity, stick with me, because one slip could cost you everything. When you're first starting out accessing .onion sites, you want to make sure that JavaScript is disabled. The reason for this is because JavaScript is used to allow websites to run scripts on your device. Hackers can exploit JavaScript to reveal identifying information about you, such as your IP address or some information about your device, which breaks any anonymity that Tor provides for you, which means your identity is no longer hidden. So to disable JavaScript, we first have to get Tor up and running. Once we have Tor open, we can just type in to the URL bar here, about colon config. And then it's gonna give you a warning here, but just go accept and continue. And then you wanna search for JavaScript dot enabled and you want to set this to just false then so double click and get just turn it false for me and that's how you disable javascript on tour the second most common mistake i see people make is not verifying your tour circuit so what does this mean when accessing a web page through tour you are connecting to various different nodes all with the task of hiding your identity from whoever wants to peep in. One way in which you could possibly be de-anonymized is through a concept known as a Sybil attack. In a Sybil attack, the attacker creates numerous fake Tor nodes with the aim of controlling or monitoring your traffic. It does this by flooding Tor with malicious nodes. So the attacker sets up numerous fake nodes especially entry and exit nodes, to increase the chance that a user's data will pass through the nodes that they control. Another way is by tracking your traffic. If the attacker controls both an entry and an exit node on the same path, they can correlate your traffic and potentially de-anonymize you. This goes against Tor's purpose and it threatens user privacy. So here's a case study of KAX17. KAX17 is a threat actor that has been active since 2017, targeting the Tor network with the apparent intent of de-anonymizing its users. Known for deploying hundreds of rogue relay nodes without contact information, KAX17's activity suggests a significant and ongoing operation, likely resource intensive and potentially state sponsored. The threat actor uses both entry and middle relays, increasing the chance that data passing through the Tor node could be traced, which could reveal the user's identities or it could compromise their privacy. Some of the key events that happened with KAX17 was its monitoring activities. KAX17 actively intercepted unencrypted traffic, capturing sensitive information from users accessing non-HTTPS websites. So what could be the potential impact of this? Well, users could have their passwords and personal data logged, exposing them to any potential identity theft or privacy violations. So in response to this, the Tor community flagged KAX17 and monitored its activity. Users were always advised to use HTTPS to protect their data from interception. So how do we go about protecting against this? So one way is just to stay up to date with whatever news is surrounding Tor. So you could read this through the Tor blog post or on the Tor subreddit. Another way to prevent against this is to use end-to-end -end encryption. So you can use stuff like uh, PGP, 
you can use stuff like a a anything that encrypts your traffic from end to end. And I have a video about how to use PGP, which you can find on my channel. You could also do a reverse IP lookup on each of these Tor nodes, and you could figure out if any of these relays or these Tor nodes belong to a malicious actor. In the case of KAX17, most of these nodes were hosted on Microsoft servers, which could be owned by federal agents such as the FBI, because only a government institution would have the funds necessary to sponsor or to buy all of these servers. The third mistake on this list is not using an alias. If you're signing up for websites on the dark web, it would be a mistake to use the same name or the same username on multiple different sites that you've used on the clear web. Let's say I register the account at test account on Twitter and test account on the dark web site. Your Twitter account can then be traced through a simple Google search and your identity could then be revealed. The same could be said vice versa. Let's say you have an alias on the dark web. You want to make sure that on the clear web or in real life, there's no link towards that alias. This particular mistake was made by Ross Ulbricht, the founder of the Silk Road. When he was asking for coding advice on Stack Overflow, he ended up getting busted since he used his real name and personal email address, rossulbricht at gmail.com. So when the feds found this, all they had to do was ask Gmail for the corresponding IP address to this email, and then go ahead and find his location and bust him down. Another common method of getting traced is talking in the same manner as you usually do on the clear web and on the dark web. So this could be things like talking in a, let's say a Discord server, or by just writing blog posts online. An attacker could identify common speech trends between your dark web persona and your clear web persona, and they can draw matches between the two, which is now even easier thanks to AI and the automation of this. So a potential solution to this is to rewrite your speech patterns in something that is different to you. So maybe you could add in a bunch of broken English or a bunch of mannerisms that you would personally not even consider doing. Just put that in there and it should make you distinct enough from your in real life persona that when you're on the dark web, you don't get traced back. The fifth mistake that I bet you're making is using Bitcoin instead of Monero. Now I know what everyone's saying. Oh, you need to use Bitcoin because Bitcoin is what you use when you're on the dark web. And that might be true. Bitcoin is only really anonymous after you have passed it through a series of mixers by obfuscating the source from which you acquired that money. Since now every place that you buy Bitcoin from requires you to present your ID as well. Without mixing, someone could just track the flow of transactions from one wallet to another. And since you bought the Bitcoin from a ledger, which required your ID and your personal documents, it can be traced back to you. So the best option hands down for currency on the dark web, or just for anonymity in general, is to use Monero. Monero is a cryptocurrency exactly like Bitcoin, except it has a lot more anonymization techniques in place. In a Monero transaction, the sender's identity is protected through ring signatures. When a user sends Monero, the protocol combines their transaction inputs with several other decoys from the blockchain. This process makes it appear as though multiple senders are involved, but only one true input is the sender, which makes it hard to be traced back to you. Monero also uses a hidden recipient with a stealth address. In order to protect the recipient's identity, each time a transaction is made, a unique one-time address is generated for the recipient, even if they have received Monero before. The recipient uses their private view key to detect and access the funds sent to the stealth addresses. This prevents the outside observers 
from seeing the recipient's actual address, making it near impossible to link received Monero funds back to them on the blockchain. Now, I could make a full video on all of the techniques and the obfuscation that Monero uses, but I'll just keep it simple and short for this video. The sixth mistake on this list is not using Tails. Using Windows or Mac or any traditional operating system is a big mistake when you're accessing the dark web. There's tons of spyware that runs on these operating systems from other applications, if not from the operating system itself. Windows 11 having their Windows recall function is a laughable example of this. So accessing the dark web from an operating system like this is not the best idea. What you can use is Tails. It's a privacy-centered operating system designed to provide strong anonymity and privacy for users. It runs entirely from a USB or DVD and lives inside the RAM of your computer. Whenever your computer is shut down from the data during your session, it ceases to exist. It is packed with multiple privacy-centric applications such as Tor, Cleopatra, Secure Email, and many more. You can check out my guide for installing Tails, which you can find on my channel. Seventh on this list is failing to use encryption. Whenever you're talking to someone on the dark web, you want to make sure that any messages you send to that other person cannot be read or understood by any middleman who is handling those messages. Not doing so could lead to inevitable consequences. The level of trust you should have should be minimal to the point where you only trust the person that you're talking to and not the website that is hosting this conversation as that could possibly lead to the compromisation of your data. One way to do this is through the use of cryptographic technologies such as OpenPGP and you can find a full guide on how to use OpenPGP or Cleopatra for Windows on my channel. The most common advice people say when using Tor is to also add in a VPN on top of this. This is just a circle jerk ran by the community and it isn't actually good advice. Here's a thought experiment for you. So you're an FBI agent and you're observing traffic from a particular VPN service provider. You potentially go up to the VPN service provider and you force them to give up whatever data they have based on their users. Now they can see that you're using Tor on their service. What questions do you think is going through that agent's mind? Is it being used for terrorism or drug dealing or human trafficking? You know, it's, it, it's not a good idea to do that. And you might ask, well, what's the difference if my ISP can see that I'm using Tor versus a VPN service provider? And here's the answer that I have to that. Using a VPN would just make you come across as very paranoid that you're hiding something and it would cause more eyes to be on you. And you know, the less eyes that you have on you, the better, right? That's not to mention that VPN service providers usually ask for your real name or your IP address or your email, and not to mention the myriad of misconfigurations or missteps that they have, which could potentially de-anonymize you and completely deserve the use of using Tor. So in short, just don't use a VPN with Tor. Much like on the clear web, on the dark web, you can encounter a lot of phishing links. So this is especially important to look after because since you're only new and you're learning this, you're more easily manipulated into doing something that you shouldn't be doing. So a good reminder is to just check the links on whatever website you're on. Sometimes you can't even trust the link even if it looks like it directs to the official site. This is due to the use of Cyrillic characters, which can fool users into clicking the link. If you want maximal protection, I suggest just typing out the URL manually. 
let's say you're sharing information on a marketplace or a forum and you want to share some pictures of what you did on a fishing trip. Some cameras actually embed the GPS coordinates of where you took that picture directly into the image file itself. It can also embed more information there, such as your phone type or the camera model and much more. So you can imagine it's not a good idea to upload images or videos in its raw form as this could lead to the compromisation of your identity. A good idea is to always strip the metadata from the image through the use of various online tools that you can easily find on GitHub or from the internet. And you can do this through a quick Google search. So that about sums it up for this video. If you have any suggestions or questions, you can hit me up on my Discord or my business email. If you like what you see, hit the thumbs up and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.